I'd like to welcome everyone to the Church of Christ, those of you on Zoom that are joining us, and those who are in service. Bob Perez will be leading us, Dr. Perez, for Isaiah chapter 6, 9 through 10, religious, religious stubbornness. Obstercy. Obstercy. Obdurcy. Obdurcy. Okay. And on this, the, he said, go and tell this, this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Robert Perez, Dr. Robert. Okay, so I'd like to start, look at this picture. That is an open versus closed system. And I added the word in there, preaching, because if you look at Isaiah's message and you look in the bulletin, he tells them to be a failure. He says, you're going to go preach to people that can see, but they can't see. And they can hear that refuse to listen. That's called religious obduracy or stubbornness. Amen? So how many of us need a little bit of, I guess, a pan hitting over the head once in a while because we tend to be a little bit stubborn? Raise up your hand. All right, everyone, right? We can be stubborn. So this message is for you, and hopefully it'll be, we can swallow it, but... It's not uh, a new problem. This is 2,700 years old. Okay, so I like to introduce it with just talking about open and closed preaching or open and closed system. Um, as I thought about this preaching and what Isaiah was to preach in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, um, the illustration that popped in my mind was this open or closed system of preaching. So let me explain what open or closed systems are because I was a science teacher and I couldn't resist that, okay? There's a couple of my former students that are here in this audience too. Um, a closed system is a system that is completely closed off from its environment, okay? So if you look at that, there's a beaker on the left that's open. There's no lid on it, that's open. So the matter can transfer from the outer environment into it. So the oxygen, it's open. You can boil it, the water would boil, and it can evaporate. That's an open system. But if you put a lid on it, matter can no longer transfer. It stay, it's, that's called a closed system. Okay? A couple of illustrations is uh, a cup of coffee, right? Those of us that like coffee at Starbucks, you notice we have, if you put coffee and you don't want it to get cold, you put it in a thermos, right? And you shut the thermos so that it stays, it turns into a closed system. And what does it do? It keeps it warm. But as soon as you open it, it'll lose, you know, its heat. So it turns into an open system. Another example is I have a bottle of water here, um, right here, with a pH of 9.5. I found them in our garage. And uh, if I were to go like this and pour it, why doesn't it pour? Because there's a lid on it. It's a closed system. But if I were to open this, right, and take off the cap and pour it, it'll pour all over the place. So that's an example of an open and closed system. How that relates to the book of Isaiah is that um, the people of Israel in chapters 1 through 5 of the book of Isaiah had become so hardened and that's just Judah, the northern kingdom. If you know anything about the history of Israel, um, they had become so hardened to the message of the prophets and to God's word. And they had these kings that were hardened and murdering each other. And there was stuff going on that God calls Isaiah in chapter 1, verse 1, to go and preach to these people of Israel. It's really the northern kingdom. And uh, they're not listening. They're just not listening. As a matter of fact, in chapter 1, I wasn't going to say this, but in chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Hear me, you heavens, listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. And then look what he gives us an illustration. He says, an ox knows its master, and a donkey knows its owner. But Israel does not know, my people do not understand. So it's interesting, he's giving an illustration of two animals 
that are stubborn, known to be stubborn, and they can be beat, but they do know their master. But he says, Israel's not that way right now. And then in chapter 2, we talked about the faithful city. She who was once full of justice has become a what? A harlot. That's the famous scene from Jesus of Nazareth. And then he cleanses the temple. Religious, sometimes people can get real obstinate in terms of doctrine and stuff, or maybe just their lifestyles that we need sometimes to hear a message. So that's what's going on here. Now the problem with what I mentioned, why I gave this illustration of a closed and open system, Israel had become so hardened to the message that God told the prophet, I need to recommission you. They're not listening in chapters one through five. It's time for recommissioning, okay? So a couple weeks ago, I preached a sermon on Isaiah's calling and God recommissions him. So for those of you that missed the sermon two two weeks ago, before we get into my topic of being a closed system or obstinate or stubborn, I want to give a quick review of the sermon or quick recap. And it's just in picture form. So in Isaiah chapter 6, if you have your Bibles, this is the famous temple scene. The t- Isaiah is in, as a, as, and uh, it says, and I'll just read it. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. So he was having a vision. And King Uzziah died in 739 BC. And by the way, I was reading about Uzziah. He was a good king, and he served Israel for 52 years. But did you know that he died of leprosy? He had leprosy. And that's an important name to remember because his name is in the birth genealogies of Jesus Christ. When you look in Matthew, some of these names that we just kind of skip over, his name is mentioned. So God is graceful. So in the year that he died, Isaiah sees this temple vision. And in the temple, he sees these little, they look like hummingbirds there. They're actually seraphim. They're these creatures that guard the holiness of God. And they're covering their eyes. They're covering their feet. And they're flying around the temple saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. You remember that. And notice I brought up this point is the seraphim's eyes are covered. Why? Because they know in the presence of God what? It's dangerous to enter God's presence in an unworthy state or in an unclean state. And if you don't know that, there's a story in the Old Testament of Moses' nephews that go into the temple when they weren't supposed to or give some incense offering that they weren't supposed to do and they got zapped. So it's not a sin to go into God's presence, right? We're coming to church. What is a sin is to get into God's presence, not prepared, your heart, your mind. And I gave the example of electricity. No one's going to touch live wires unless you have the right equipment, right? So if you have the right equipment, you can go and be an electrician. My grandson's an electrician, and he knows that. Same thing in God's presence. And that's why the holy seraphim are covering their eyes, because even them who are holy have to cover their eyes because to look at the face of God in the Old Testament is immediate death. So that's chapter 1, chapter 6, 1 through 4. Moses sees, I mean, Isaiah sees this vision. And his immediate response is this next picture. What does he say? He responds, I'm done for. If you could see that little picture, there's the train of God's robe. You could see God's robe, his feet. That's all he saw. And these little seraphim that look like really small little hummingbirds, but they're gigantic. And Isaiah sees this and he says, I'm done for because I've seen God. Because he knows to enter God's presence is dangerous. And he says, I'm done for. Woe is me. I'm ruined because I have, I have unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And here's where God's grace comes. Instead of getting zapped, instead of getting scolded, and I thought about this, I read an article, instead of being berated for him being a man not prepared to enter God's presence, the seraphim in God's grace comes and takes care of it. He goes, I'll take care of you. No, you're purified. And he takes these coals from the altar, touches his lips. He atones for his sin. He purges his sin from his lips. 
And the interesting commentator, commentator state, stated, he touched his lips, but his lips were not burned. When Moses saw the burning bush, he goes, wow, there's a bush that's burning that's not consumed. So think about entering God's presence right now. You get to start to enter God's presence on earth as it is in heaven right now. And if you do it with the right equipment and understand that you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, what happens? We can enter God's presence and our sin can be purged away and we can enter God's presence in a holy state just like what happened to Isaiah the prophet because God needed a preacher who was up to the task. God needs people who are up to the task, right? And sometimes when we look at God and we come into church, we're thinking about ourselves. I'm not worthy. I, I make mistakes. I got an argument yesterday with my mom. I got an argument with my boyfriend. I got a, I, I'm just not doing it right. And you keep thinking about all the stuff about you. And God says we need to get off of ourselves and let's get on the, to the mission. And that's what Isaiah does. Notice it's I statement. I am done for. Woe is me. I, I, I. He's, talk, he's worried about himself. He is so caught up in his own worldview and guilt before God, he can't hear. He had become a religious, stubborn prophet who needed some grace. So that leads up to where we're right now in the text. That was my sermon two weeks ago. And before I preach on it, I'll just give you what's at stake. Think about this. If God were to tell you right now, I want you to go preach a sermon or preach a me message that would be a complete failure, would you go? If God told you, you would go, right? Because you know God's a holy person. He says, you, no one's going to listen to you. Isaiah, but your job is to go. And here's the message. So I want you to think about that. If God were to tell you to go on a mission that would be a failure, failure, would you go? And that exactly is what Isaiah is called to do. And here's his message. Believe it or not, now that Isaiah is purged of his sin and he got off his himself, in verse 8, I'm going to read it from the Bible here, and I have verse 9 displayed there. Verse 8 says this, Then I heard, first he saw, but it wasn't until he was able to be purged of his atonement, of his sin, that he was able to hear God's voice. So what is it that hinders you from hearing God's voice? What is it that gets in the way of your day-to-day -day life that prevents you from seeing and not just seeing, but hearing God? Well, I should say, what is it that prevents me from doing that? So that's a very important text. Then I heard. Are you hearing? So finally, someone's able to hear God. But his message is, Isaiah, thank you for finally realizing or finally being able to hear me, but the people are not going to be able to hear. And here's the scripture. God said to him, go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Think of that's a failure. failure. That's called a double bind message. It's mentioned twice. Another way of saying it, I put into my notes, is this: hearing you can do. Israel, he's telling the people, hearing you can do. You can hear me, but you will not hear. You will not understand. Seeing, you can keep or you can try, but you will not see or you will not perceive. And that's what the message is. And that's called a double bind. Do you know that? 
It's a double bind because that's just in one verse, verse 9. To reinforce Isaiah's failed mission, God makes it very explicit to him and to us. So think about it. I'm telling you about a failed mission, about religious stubbornness. Hopefully we're not that way, but it's a message to us to be reminded, amen, of how we can be at times. So I wrote this in a unique style. It's called the chiastic structure. It's like an X. And a chiastic structure is, it's three things that build up and then it comes backwards. Just to make sure that Isaiah got it. It's a closed system. That's why I gave the illustration of a closed versus open system. One prophet, Patricia Tao, in her commentary, I was reading this, and this is why I got the idea of a closed system and chemistry. She said, this message, contra contrary to both human mercy and divine grace, has troubled interpreters throughout history. This verse... It's troubled interpreters throughout history. Here's why. It's thorough condemnation is understood not only by its repetition, hearing, hear, and do not understand, seeing, see, and do not know, but by the chiastic structure that I've shown there in verse 10. And then she says, it's a closed system excluding all remediation. In other words, there is no chance to repent. That's a good message, isn't it? <laughs> Not a real happy message. There's no chance. So why? Why is God telling a prophet to preach to people and he doesn't want them to change? One commentator, our professor in our Isaiah class said, basically, God wanted to show Isaiah the state in which the people truly are. Okay? The state in which the people truly are. So just to kind of give us off the hook a little bit. It's no coincidence, or coinkydink sometimes we say, that the next story is about King Ahaz, the most stubborn king of Israel. Chapter 6 is Isaiah's calling. Chapter 7 is Ahaz. And guess what? I'm going to read this chiastic structure. In chapter 7, verse 10, Isaiah goes to Ahaz to warn him, and he does the opposite about what God told him to do. God tells him, hey, they're not going to listen to you, but he still tries to convince him. And look at Ahaz's response. I'm just going to read this and then come back to this chiastic structure. In chapter 7, verse 10, it says, and look what it says here. It wasn't just Isaiah that said it. It was the Lord speaking through Isaiah. Verse 10 of chapter uh, 7, And the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask the Lord your God for a sign. Can you imagine if God told you, All right, I know you're stubborn. I know you need help. But would you please ask me for a sign and I'll give it to you. How many people would say, Okay, I'll do it. Raise up your hand. I would. I'd want to ask God, Yeah, give me a sign, God. And some of you that didn't, maybe you need to hear this then. Okay, again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But I, Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not. And I will not put the Lord, the God, to the test. So I wanted to just show you, that was the king immediately following this message or this vision that God gave to Isaiah. And if you look at that picture there, Isaiah is the man like this. Right? You see his hands are up. And if you look to him, uh, the guy above him, I had to, what is he doing? He's plugging his ears. I don't know if that's a rendition of King Ahaz, but when you plug your ears, or you have plugged ears, or a hard heart, a calloused heart, or eyes that do not see, this is the message. And here's the chiastic structure. It's a double bind. There is no remediation. Make the heart of this people calloused. The word is in Hebrew is fat. We have a bad heart. And it's arterial sclerosis from the inside. It's not good. It has to be cleansed out. That's just a medical way of thinking about it. Right? 
the arteries are plugged, you have all this stuff in there and you have to go in there with these little stethoscopes and all these things and clean it out. And he's saying, your job is to make the heart of these people calloused. Make their ears dull or heavy. So keep that picture in mind. Close their eyes, shut their eyes. That's your job, preacher. And God needed a closed system prophet in this case. No wonder Isaiah had to be cleansed. Because when you're told to do something that is not the most popular message, his tendency would to do, be to do the opposite, is to run from it. But he did it. And look what God says. Here's the point where I said it's a closed system of preaching that has no remediation, no chance for repentance, because look what God says in verse 10d. Otherwise, or lest, they might see or look with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. So God doesn't want it. What you see here, I've got to sh explain this picture. It's easy for me to pontificate up here about, yes, our job is to preach and people aren't going to listen and you, I feel good about myself. But if you study this history of Israel, this vision scene occurred in 739 uh, B.C. Um, Assyria was in power. They were brutal to the northern kingdom of Israel and they took over Samaria and made it fall in 722 BC. Meanwhile, Isaiah is preaching to in Jerusalem, which is not too far from Samaria, maybe about an hour drive from here to Santa Clarita. And so as Santa Clarita is being destroyed by the Assyrians, Isaiah is preaching to the people in Santa Paula or in Jerusalem, and they know what's going on over there. And he's saying, look, Assyria is taking out the northern kingdom of Israel because they have been terribly stubborn. And by the way, Babylon, who's even worse than Assyria in 150 years, is going to destroy Assyria and they're going to take you down. And so that's the, that's the condition, that's the state in which Israel is in at this point in history. And in 586 B.C., the people didn't listen. It's interesting, it took 150 years for this to come to fruition when he preached it. But it did happen. It was called the exile. I thought about this, and there's a couple of verses I wanted to just share with you in closing because it's, it's a little bit rough. In Deuteronomy 29.4, when Israel was in the wilderness for 40 years, this isn't the first time Israel had become stubborn or the Hebrew people had become stubborn. They didn't follow God's commandments. Remember, they went from Egypt to Mount Sinai, and a, and a trip that should have taken them two weeks to go from Egypt to the Promised Land took them 40 years. Why? because they rebelled against God, right? We all know that. But look what it says in Deuteronomy 29.4. I kind of put it on the bottom. Here's why God did not allow them to go in. To this day, it says, but to this day, the Lord has not, look what he says, the Lord has not given you a heart that understands, eyes that see, or ears that hear. It was God that put them in the spirit of stupor. And that's challenging to us. This is why a lot of people don't like to preach on this text. We like to preach on the temple vision, the seraphim and seeing God, but we don't want to do this part of it. It's interesting when Jesus preached his, in his ministry, this passage, this closed system of preaching is mentioned in all four gospels. Mark 4, verse 12, in relation to the parables, why people don't understand. It's in Luke chapter 8, verse 10. It's related, he takes the same position as Mark does. It's in Matthew chapter 13, verse 13, and I'm going to read that because I just felt it was important. And this is what Matthew says about this parable or this concept in Isaiah. He says, um, he speaks in parables. This is when Jesus used to speak in stories. He speaks in parables, not in order that they might. Let me slow down. He speaks in parables, not in order that they may not understand, 
but rather because they do not understand. He explains it to his disciples. And then he tells them this. You know, it's a closed system of preaching that Jesus doesn't want these certain Pharisees, these certain leaders that are so obstinate to hear the message because they'll kill him. There are some people in this day and age in 2022 that are so obstinate to the word of God that they'll kill us. They'll just shut you down before you even get a chance. But look what Jesus tells his disciples, and I hope this is what he tells us. And I'm just going to read it. He says, In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing but never understanding. And I'm going to back it up. This is what Jesus is quoting as he's explaining to his disciples. He's quoting this verse. You will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For these people, this people's heart has become callous. That's the next verse. They hardly hear with their ears. They have closed, eye, closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their ears, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. And then look what he tells his disciples. But blessed are you. Blessed are you. Blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it. And hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Now that's the message. Complete despair. Do you feel it? So I don't want to leave you completely in despair today, okay? If you look closely at that picture, the axe, there's a guy with the axe at the ground, that's at the stump of the tree, and he's going to chop down the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom through Assyria and through Babylonia. But if you look at the tree that's cut down, Right in the middle of it, there's a little plant growing out of it. There's a little stump. And so I'd like to end with this, this little thought. And this was in our commentary on Patricia Toll's commentary on this. And she said, where there is life, there is hope. Amen? Where there is life, there is hope. So the biggest comeback in history, in the history of the world, and I got this from a 2017 marquee from Boston.